Research area four is named quantum networks with engineered solid state quantum emitters. What does that mean? Research area four began as an area that focused on color centers, novel kinds of emitters in the solid state and wide band gap materials, such as color centers in diamond that I'm going to talk about, silicon carbide and other wide band gap materials. But because of the inherent um, uh, the choice of those materials, um, the inherent integrability of those kinds of color centers and their quantum mechanical behavior into a larger platform that allowed the transport of those signals over distances that constitutes a network, it became natural for Research Area 4 to expand into a broader area, as you see here, symbolically, um, to form the backbone, the network the connections between uh, the qubits. And as such, it is not only a test bed to explore different kinds of networks, particularly for those that require the use of photons to transfer quantum mechanical information, but also as a test bed for a variety of materials, including we've already begun um, uh, looking at materials from research area one, and hopefully we'll extend that to the different kinds of materials in all of CQ. So it has three major components. Um, one component are the material candidates, beginning with uh, the materials that defined our inception, um, envy centers in diamond, but broadening out to different kinds of color centers in diamond and silicon carbide, a variety of other materials. We're now extending the notion of those kinds of defect-based um, quantum emitters into um, 2D materials, we're beginning to do that. But with all of these materials that we, be, we began very early in research area four, to not only um, characterize the behavior of the emitters themselves, but to put those emitters within a framework. So it became natural to integrate some of those color centers within the framework um, so that they could perform a single photon emitters. Um, begin to develop them as atomic memory, so they become the device components of the network, um, and also as quantum repeaters and optical cavities. And so naturally, as we begin to explore the materials, we also began to explore the framework that protected those materials and allowed them to behave as devices within the network. And then finally, there's the network backbone itself, and you see parts of that indicated schematically. Photonic integrated circuits, that are formed of diamond, which was a natural, um, which is a natural platform given the extensive work done in NV centers in diamond. You've heard about lithium niobate and also hybrid circuits that incorporate aluminum nitride um, or silicon nitride, sometimes hybrid with diamond. And there is a natural um, extension to um, networks that are not operating only in the photonic domain, but perhaps um, will, um, trans will allow transduction or interactions with microwave signals, for example, allowing access into superconducting um, qubits. So uh, we had our inception in working with um, the nitrogen vacancy center, um, as you see here. And I think over past research reviews, you've heard about a variety of color centers, and I'm showing you um, a set of color centers in diamond. Nitrogen vacancy, a silicon vacancy, and germanium vacancy. And the reason that there are a variety of color centers to choose from is because as exciting as NV centers in diamond were, um, as we became more sophisticated in what we expected of these color centers, um, we began to demand um, more important, we began to um, demand more limiting constraints. So basically these are a class of solid state emitters in which inherently because of the electronic structure of the materials, there's a unique coupling of spin states with photon states. And so the photon states give us an idea of the spin state of that qubit. Um, and this intimate relationship between the spin 
and the photon state or photon intensity provides a natural way of our preparing um, quantum mechanical states or spin states via photons and similarly of reading out spin states through optical means. So therefore the photon part of that spin photon alliance becomes, if you will, a flying qubit, a qubit reporter that can be transported over long distances, whereas the spin will give us um, exquisite information about the local atomic environment. So the ideal characteristics um, becomes, if we want to move further and look into um, a network, um, a quantum mechanical network, is to actually look for those candidates that in fact have long spin coherence times, and in addition, insensitivity, insensitivity to local fluctuations in charge. Um, it's a factor that we call local uh, low spectral diffusion, and um, lower coupling of the signature, the photon signature, signature to what, for many of these candidates, has a broad photon phonon sideband, as indicated here by the spectrum of NB minus in, in diamond. So this is what we call the zero phonon line. That's a signature that gives us some indication by dint of its um, wavelength of a spin and by dint of its intensity of the spin state of that NB minus. But here's the broad phonon sideband, which sometimes provides or very often provides an impediment to the clear readout and contrast of that signal. And because of that, because there are a variety of choices, um, the idea, the frontier of defect states in wide band gap materials is beginning to open up so that the community realizes that there is far more than just NB minus and diamond, how, what, however wonderful it was. The community is looking beyond not only in diamond, but in a wide variety of other wide band gap materials. So what you've seen before in previous reviews are examinations of other centers in diamond. You've re reported on germanium vacancies and silicon vacancies in diamond. We had um, recent success in using tin vacancies in diamond with transform limited linelets. Um, there's been quite a lot of um, work um, recently, um, primarily um, with Pre's work on ab initio predictions relating to other kinds of centers in diamond, for example, um, lead vacancies. And then there's also been work carried on um, with uh, Stephen Richardson team Casiris on better isolation of color centers, in this partic particular case, silicon vacancies in diamond, by tuning the environment or, or tuning the Fermi level. In fact, um, this idea of looking at the broad spectrum of possibilities for new kinds of defects that have this unique spin photon tunability has induced um, Pre to look at um, a whole possible new class of emitters, group three quantum emitters, um, through a variety of um, first principles calculations and um, basic um, explorations and, and, and simulations. So I just show you the wide swathe of some of the materials that she's considering and that her group is doing calculations on. But beyond, um, and I'll show you another example of a, um, a defect center that has those properties of long spin coherence and um, a finely tuned optical transition but before I go there, I want to say that um, in working with this class of defects, quite early and quite naturally, um, we in this group began to think about the framework as well as the defect itself. So what is the framework? The framework is often the local environment, sometimes in the basic material, as you can see here from this um, illustration of a photonic crystal cavity that is etched out of diamond with this bright spot indicating the position of, let's say, an NB center, a silicon vacancy in the diamond, 
That framework is what we call a cavity. It is a local protective environment that isolates the cubic from um, decoherence and both optical and electronic noise, but also has ways of interacting with the, with the qubit so that we enhance its um, photon emission, the rate of photon emission, so that we um, are able to elicit a, um, a more robust signal. And in a sense, this framework is what we also may call a quantum node in this very a schematic representation of a network what, where we have quantum nodes connected by quantum channels. So think perhaps of the quantum channel as being waveguides or fibers, and the quantum nodes being these frameworks. Sometimes we call them repeaters, sometimes we call them other devices. So these distinctively engineered cavities you've seen in the past can provide um, a means of enhancing the optical signal of the color center, as well as isolating. It's also a means of, by controlling the cavity, controlling the qubit itself to augment the optical signal and to tune optical resonances by a variety of techniques. And you've already seen, you'll see again here, um, that there are techniques that are not just optical and electrical, but even the use of string. So, um, and again, uh, you've seen this before, but in expanding on the idea of a framework um, with Marco's group, here is an example of embedding a silicon vacancy within a diamond, um, so it's silicon vacancy in diamond. Here is a photonic crystal cavity. It's the framework that enhances the optical signal of that silicon vacancy so that you can get a strong zero phonon light um, and you can enhance the signal. This um, framework, this cavity, um, naturally lends itself to the creation of a waveguide. And what you see is this diamond taper, this waveguide, sends out the photon signal and that photon signal can be uh, coupled into a fiber taper. And so uh, the photon signal read out. Marcos Group has also been pioneers in the use of um, different ways of controlling the, um, the signature of that qubit. Again, the silicon vacancy center um, placed within structures that very much look like a cantilever. So it's a thin um, membrane-like structure that can uh, be mechanically deformed. And depending on the position um, of the silicon vacancy within that cantilever structure, you have a way of tuning the strain. The strain, in turn, can tune the orbitals of the electrons in the silicon vacancy and therefore change the energy levels. And what you're going to hear a little bit more in detail about is that if you take that um, strain tuning to um, take it further to the possibility it can be used in feedback control and suppression of spectral diffusion. So basically, here's an example of looking at um, the frequency of the silicon vacancy as a function of time. You see that frequency shifting. This is what's called spectral diffusion. It's because of a changing electrical environment around the silicon vacancy. But with the feedback of strain and the tuning of the energy levels, you can see that um, a lot of that spectral diffusion has been suppressed. Um, and in fact, um, uh, SMARC will be giving one of the presentations following mine that will give you much further detail about this and the broader context. So, in addition, um, in the panoply of um, these defect qubits, we want to go to a very different material system that we've talked about from time to time, a material system other than diamond. It's in this case, it's 4-H silicon carbide. And the particular defect that we're looking at um, are silicon vacancies. So this is an image of 4-H silicon carbide, and you see two places where silicon is missing. 
Um, those two silicon vacancies are actually distinctive because of the crystalline structure of a silicon carbide. They are, have locally very different crystallographic orientation and therefore those vacancies are responsive to a different environment. Um, silicon vacancies in silicon carbide exhibit many of those ideal characteristics that we're looking for. They have long span coherence times measured in the order of T2s of milliseconds, um, sometimes longer. Stable optical resonances, 19 megahertz line widths have been measured. And um, what is exciting here is that these are defects that are obtainable in commercially off the shelf wafers. You can get six inch wafers, you can get four inch wafers in a variety of polytypes and that's because silicon carbide has long been an industry standard for um, high, wide band app, high power, high frequency electronic devices, as well as optical devices. The framework for silicon carbide are, um, again, these kinds of photonic crystal cavities. This nanobridge cavity, which is a modulation of index of refraction shown by the holes. Um, so that the resulting patterns of high electromagnetic field or modes are shown top down in side view. Um, so it is a high electric magnetic field strength at a given frequency confined to volumes of about um, a wavelength in, in the material cubed. Um, the power of such a framework can be easily seen here where we look at two spectra. One, a spectra without a cavity taken in bulk for a silicon carbide to look at um, 300 Kelvin and then even at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And what you can see that is even at liquid nitrogen temperatures, the effect of the phonon sideband obscures the clear signal of these two different vacancies in for a silicon carbide. So that the signal to noise um, is um, not high enough, or the contrast is not high enough for what we would want. This is a spectrum taken at room temperature um, of silicon vacancy in one of those, um, in that framework, in a photonic crystal cavity, and this is normally untuned. I'll show you in a minute what um, the tuned response looks like. When we tune um, the cavity frequency, beginning in a situation here, where this is the cavity mode. Uh, V1 actually has um, two incarnations because one ground state, two different excited states, so they're called V1 prime and V1. This shows a successive tuning because we just changed the natural frequency of the cavity mode, and as we tune successively, we move this cavity mode into frequency resonance first with the V1 prime and then with the V1 signature. So what you can see clearly here is that on tuning into frequency resonance, we can enhance the outcome intensity of those transitions by a factor of 75 and 22 respectively. The details of why we see a different actually enhancement um, are quite interesting. I'm not gonna talk about here but actually tells us about the power of these cavities in understanding the local atomic environment of these defects. Nonetheless, even with an intensity enhancement of almost two orders of magnitude, we could do better in the cavity control of the defect. We have that resonance and frequency, which you see um, by dint of tuning, but if the silicon vacancy actually could be placed deterministically right at the center of the maximum of the electromagnetic field, we could possibly get stronger coupling. So I show you something idealized. I show you a single defect placed exactly at the center of the maximum of the field, whereas in fact, we probably have an ensemble of defects and they are approximately in the same region, but not necessarily coupled to the maximum of the field. So the question is, can we nudge defects into spatial overlap with the cavity mode? And this is something that's very exciting for silicon carbide. 
for a silicon vacancy in silicon carbide because probably for diamond and probably for a defect that has two components like a nitrogen um, vacant, a, a, um, a uh, substitutional or interstitial plus a vacancy or two components, um, what I'm going to show you would not be so easily possible. So what you see here is a spectrum in blue of um, actually one of our usual um, cavity um, emission spectra. And then what's happened, actually these cavities have not before been subject to an anneal. But after an anneal of the defect in the cavity at 750 degrees for half an hour, what you see is the red. The shift in resonance is because during that anneal, that anneal was done in oxygen, so the cavity oxidized a bit, so there's a natural shift in resonance. But the increase in peak intensity, and this is stochastic because uh, there's an equal number of cavities where the peak signal diminishes, but that increase in intensity suggests that some of the defects during that annealing process may have moved into, diffused or hopped into a better spatial environment than previously. So our interpretation is that um, this anneal has produced a, um, a diffusion or a hop of this particular defect so that it's in better spatial overlap with the maximum of the mode and recent experiments that have been done have exhibited the same phenomena um, without using a high temperature anneal, but using a laser anneal at room temperature um, done at below band gap and above band gap irradiation. And Roger Defoe is going to be talking about some of the simulations he's done, and he's done in conjunction with a summer student um, this past summer, who was at Howard University working with Pratiba Dev. Um, and then further, um, we talked about what I've spoken about before is um, the emitters, the quantum emitters that are our heritage. That is, defects in solid state materials that have wide band gap. But naturally, the question becomes, can we use um, the beautiful potential of all the two-dimensional materials we've been hearing about? Can we, for example, use two-dimensional materials and either create defects or create those kinds of emitters um, by design? Because if we could do that, um, rather than working in bulk, you can imagine that we could actually just write out arrays of defects um, that we could then couple within a network. So um, PRE in particular is looking beyond diamond to look at quantum emitters in, in 2D materials and uh, from a theoretic, theoretical first principles point of view. Um, and more broadly, um, research area four for quite a while has been, as a, um, as a group, been exploring the potential of using two-dimensional materials because they're quite a natural way to integrate onto the, uh, the backbone of the platform. So you perhaps remember before um, the work that Marco has done using tungsten diselenide draped on silicon dioxide pillars to form point emitters or quantum emitters. Um, more recently, we've been exploring um, with Jing Kong's group the idea of using two-dimensional materials like um, moly disulfide, draping it on top. So the idea is if we were to put these two-dimensional materials onto the platform, can we integrate those two-dimensional materials onto the framework of devices and amplifiers that are part of that platform? There's been quite a lot of work done which has tried to use these organic um, cavities. This is a micro disc. I showed you earlier photonic crystal nanocavities. Um, and um, the responses of putting an external emitter onto um, a cavity. But 
I think there remains a great deal of work to do to calibrate first the performance of the cavity, the performance of the 2D material separately, and to further understand in detail how they interact. So this cavity that you see is basically a gallium nitride microdisc. It's a gallium nitride microdisc that actually has embedded in it indium and gallium nitride quantum wells. Why did we do this? We wanted to determine beforehand that if we probed this structure um, without the MOS2, that it itself um, was made well enough so that it exhibited modes and was optically efficient. Not only was it optically efficient, this particular microdisc actually exhibited lasing. This is the lasing peak, and the lasing threshold was um, less than um, um, a milliwatt per um, square, uh, it's less than a milliwatt, not milliwatt per square centimeter. The issue is, so this provides a good calibration point. The interesting factor is that once we drape the MOS2 on top of this lasing disc, it completely quenched the lasing. And so Andy Greenspawn is going to tell us a little bit more about the context of the interaction of the MOS2 with this particular microcavity. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of the perspective of research projects in research area four is that backbone. Quantum networks based on diamond, silicon nitride. I think you've seen examples of this before. The work um, in Dirk England's group that have taken large scale membranes of diamond and fabricated photonic elements, waveguides um, coupled to um, uh, cavities and emitters, and also the hybrid integration of maybe um, nitrogen, vacancy cent nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond that are coupled into a silicon nitride photonic platform. So, um, and then Finally, you've heard a great deal about this, um, which is the idea of using another solid state platform, that of lithium niobate, that offers um, a variety of um, other very compelling advantages. Um, this is, uh, Hyperlite is the company that uh, Bob described earlier that Marco has started. Um, and uh, it's an exciting new pathway that can be also formed the platform for um, the as a test bed for evaluation of a broad set of materials. So this is um, the overview perspective. And in the end, I'll just show you again um, that uh, what Research Area 4 endeavors to do is to work towards providing those connections, the quantum connectors as well as the quantum nodes and hopefully research area four can provide that um, test bed for transmission and propagation of signals these are optical not electrical but that we can provide that um, test bed more broadly for um, many of the um, material endeavors uh, for cq and that's it